Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers and rock stars of life. I am Katie Brewer and my guest today needs no introduction. So instead, I want to tell him something about a time I spent with two great friends, Fiona Colgrave and Ben O'Halloran, last winter. And we were following this crazy Dutch guy, Wim Hof, who advocates cold swims. And we really got into it and we would try colder and colder waters. And we even took an axe with us one time and broke the ice to go in. And it was probably one of the most unglamorous exercises anyone's ever done because you're in a swimming costume and a woolly hat. Dreadful look. But while we were changing, we would be talking and under normal circumstances, we would be talking about our families or the political situation of wherever. But no, we weren't talking about that. The conversation would go like this. I'm up to episode three. No, 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 you can't tell me that. I'm not there yet. Can you believe that happened to Shirin? It would be things like, I can't believe he did that. I have no respect for them anymore. And how are they going to get out of that? We were obsessed and our lives took second place to this series we were watching and in particular our hero Doron. So thank you for being here today. I am quite beside myself actually to be talking to Doron from Fauda who is actor, screenplay writer, ex-Israeli special forces, Leo Raz. Thank you for being here today. Wow. So, you know, I just came right now from a ice bath that I did. I just arrived from that. Oh my gosh. So do you have it in your house? No, no. I went to my therapist and we did it over there. How long do you stay in? Depends. If I'm going, there is minus 90 Celsius, just like a freezer that I'm getting in. So three minutes or four minutes. When you go to the bath, it's something like two minutes. Well, you're way ahead of us then. So we were thinking we were quite good with our ice axe. <laughs> Let's go to your upbringing. If we go from the start and just carry on through and forgive me because my knowledge of Hebrew is zero. So I am sure I'm going to be making mistakes with the way I pronounce things. So please correct me as well. I hope that my English is better than your Hebrew. I'll try. Anybody's anything is better than my (laughs) Hebrew. Your parents immigrated to Israel from Iraq and Algeria and you grew up in the Israeli settlement Ma'ali Adumin? Yeah, Ma'ali Adumin, yeah. Okay. What memories do you have of your childhood? Wow, a lot. So when I was four, my father immigrated from Iraq when he was young. He also worked for the Israeli Defense Forces for a while. And my mom worked for an advocat company. And then my father wanted to be a settler, to go to the desert, in the middle of the desert, Judea Desert, near the Dead Sea, and to build a city over there. And so as a young person, I remember as a four-year-old kid that we didn't have roads, we didn't have anything. It was like trailers on a mountain. And this is how I grew up. And then my father, that he wasn't such a good businessman, opened a nursery for plants in the middle of the desert when nobody was there. (laughs) So I remember that every day after school, I went there. And for the first time, I had to speak in Arabic because all the people that worked with my father were Arabs from the area and they didn't know Hebrew. And for me, every day, they were my friends, you know, after school. So I had to learn Arabic in order to understand them. And it wasn't like a very good Arabic, but for the basics. I had a great childhood. It was in the desert, outside, horses, donkeys, sheep, plants, scorpions, snakes, traveling. I'm a free spirit now, but then I was much more free spirit as a child. When your father was in special forces, were you aware what he was doing for a living at that time? He was in the Israeli Shin Bet. It's like the MI5, I think, or MI6. I I didn't know what he he was doing till actually a few years ago that we were starting to talk about it because it was like very confidential. He didn't want to talk about it. And, but I knew that he knows Arabic very well with a very good accent, perfect accent. And I know till today, my father, he he preferred to speak in Arabic than in Hebrew. And he used to tell me when I was young, and you can see it on Fauda, that in in the second season, I have my father over there saying to Shirin, he said to her, and they are very similar, my father in the show and my real father, just the same, they speak the same Arabic, and they live in the same kind of places, doing the same things. And he tells Shirin that, don't forget that we are Arab Jews. 
And this is something that my father used to tell me when I was young, because in Israel, it's a place that people coming from so many countries in the world, it's like a melting pot. And everybody trying to be like the old people, you know, that they were there for a long time in Israel. And most of them came from Europe. Sometimes people forget that they are, their roots are from Arab countries. And my father reminds me, so we were listening at home to Bach and Chopin and, and Tchaikovsky, but also Farid al Atrash and like uh, Egyptian music and, and Lebanese music. So it was mixed. Everything was mixed. And I'm very glad that he was doing it back in the day because I grew up when I know that I'm a mix of everything. And then at the age of 18, you join the Israeli Defense Forces and you're a commando in the elite undercover counterterrorism unit known as Sayeret Duvdivan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> More or less. Yeah. <laughs> How was it that you were put there? First of all, in Israel, it's mandatory. You have to go to the army for three years. Everything that I'm doing in my life, I'm trying to be number one and I'm trying to be the best and to do my best. So I wanted to go to the best place in the army. And for me, it was back in the day, was best was very dangerous and, and to do very meaningful things. And it's not about the country. It's about you as a person that you want to actually challenge yourself to be the best all the time. And it's very hard because you're starting like, 30 people and you're ending five in the end of the course, in the end of the year and a half. So it, it is very hard for your soul, for your mental health, physically, everything. So it was an amazing experience. And I think I gained a lot from it. And it wasn't easy most of the time. It was hard. Was it something that at the time, I guess you just have to get on and do it? And is it something that when you reflect back, you can think that was actually fairly traumatic? It was traumatic. I didn't know that actually. 13 years ago, I went for my first time in life to a therapist because I got married. So I was very, I was stressed. So I didn't know. <laughs> well, it's a stressful time. Still, it's, it is stressful. I hope my wife won't hear it, but no, but she knows. And at the first time that I was sitting there, I asked the, the therapist if we can change seats because I wanted to sit with my eyes to the door. And he looked at me and after a few meetings, he told me that there is a name to the thing that I'm suffering from. And I said, what? A scared groom? What, what, what is it? And he said, uh, no, you have PTSD. It's post-traumatic disorder that actually I didn't know that I have it. I thought that I'm a regular guy, that my thoughts are very, you know, it's like everybody thinks the way I think, but it was actually quite twisted thoughts that I had. Everything was supposed to be, I had to be alert all the time. I had to know everything. I had to know where is the entrance, where, I, where I'm sitting. All the time I was prepared for the bad, not for the good like I am now. I'm preparing for the good now. And I think when we wrote Fauda, we didn't, I, I started to deal with those traumas because I didn't know that I had those traumas. But after that, I started to talk about it. And I talked with my partner, Avi, that he was in the Special Forces as well. He was in Duvdevan as well with me. We started to talk about things that I realized that I forgot everything. I don't remember nothing from my service in the army. I didn't remember names of places, villages, operations, actions that we had. I forgot everything. And Avi was sitting there and reminded me, reminded me of things that I used to do in the army. So he was in the same unit with you at the same time? Yeah. He was younger than me, but he knows a lot about me because people knew about me back over there. I was quite famous in this place. And we started to talk about it. And then I realized that I need to deal with that. And I think through creation, through Fauda and through the writing and acting and go back there again to do the thing that we used to do, I think I got healed from my post-trauma for sure. I don't have all those symptoms that I used to have. So it was through creation. It was amazing uh, a journey for me to understand and to relive it again in order to forget it again. Well, it makes complete sense. And you know, Fada does seem very, very real. Now, how close to the truth is it actually? It is close to the truth, but still we have to understand that it's a show. It's a drama. You know, there are people who's doing this kind of actions in Israel, all over the world, in England as well. You have those kind of units in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria. And there are people who's working undercover all over the world for decades. And we try to be as realistic as we can because it was part of our healing process, it was very important to us to be as real as we can. Everything, how they handle the guns, how they talk, 
what the language that they saying, the special accent that they talking. But also there is a lot of, of things that happened in my life, but I never fell in love with an Arab doctor, but it was good for the show. But still, it's a drama, so you have to invent some stuff. I never blew up a sheik. No. <laughs> Israel is under threat from all quarters, and many Israelis must have relatives who were in the Holocaust and who underwent some of the most barbaric treatment and injustices any human being can ever endure. So it's understandable that Israel is always poised for war. It's understandable why they ask three years of every young man and two years of every young woman in mandatory service. Well, I read some of the 80% of young people actually do it. Do you think, looking back, that they're right to ask that of their young citizens? Yeah, I think that everyone needs to give something to the society. It doesn't matter where you are. If it's in Israel or in, in, in the USA or in, in Britain, it doesn't matter where you are. When you are young, when you are 18, you are now become very responsible and you learn a lot about yourself. You stress everything that you have in your brain, in your soul, in your muscles. You stress everything to learn in order to control yourself. So there is so many things that you learn. You know, people talking about Israel as a startup nation, right? There are so many startups in Israel, much more than compared to other places in the world. It's crazy. Why is it? Why are there so many inventors? And I think because the experience in the army, you have to be very innovative. You have to know how to improvise. You have to control and to know how you work under stress and under pressure. And, you know, I'll give you a story. My wife she didn't w went to the army in Israel. And I remember we went to a trip with the, our jeep and I saw like a huge boulder in the middle of the road. I don't know how to, to move and how to go straight. My wife said, okay, let's go back home. It's okay. <laughs> we enjoyed. It was great. Let's go back to the hotel. And it was, let's, let's, let's have fun. And I said, what? If I see obstacle, I want to control the obstacle. I don't want to let the obstacle control me. And we did it. I moved and I, and, I, and I struggled. I broke my car. In the end of the day, I was handling this obstacle. It's just like in Fauda. You know, in Fauda, nobody wanted the show. Everybody said, no, no, we don't want it. They're all the broadcasters. So if I was like someone that wasn't in where I was in the army, probably I would give up very early, in early stages. We know how to fight. And we know that if someone closing the door, you will find the window. It's a good thing. In the other side, to take a young person and to put him in such a stressful place, in a war zone, it's not easy. And it's very easily that you can corrupt your soul when you are in these situations. So it's a very delicate place to be. You have to learn how to be a man, even though that you are in such a stressful places. How to keep your morality, even though that it's easy to lose it. It's a very delicate thing to be in the army. And when you said in the beginning about that Israel is, we are in a war all the time. So I would tell you something that when I was young in my school, every day we were singing a song that called for a peace. Shir la Shalom, we call it. Song for the peace. We're waiting for the peace. We were longing for the peace. And so even though we were in a war all the time, I think what we really want what I really want and what my goal is to bring peace to the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Arab world. And I think we can do it. We need to lose the thinking of living in a war zone all the time. Yeah. And I think you have a very balanced view in Fauda. But let's come back to that because after the army, you head straight to LA and you become the bodyguard of Arnold Schwarzenegger, which, you know, amazing that the Terminator needs a bodyguard, but you did it. How did you find that experience? It's not such a huge thing. I came from Israel. I was, as you said, in a war zone. I did crazy things. And then I had to sit in a house of someone, <laughs> open the gate, closing the gate, sometimes going out with his kid, sometimes going out with him. You must have days where you think, well, let's just hope something happens today because I'm trained for this. I was bored. And I think he was, they all were, his family were amazing. And very welcoming. But in the end of the day, it was nothing. Really, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But it wasn't like, you know, there is this uh, movie, The Bodyguard, that you, they, they're falling in love. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's just the movies. And you were there for a couple of years. And then what made you decide to come back to Israel? 
I was there, and then I traveled with my best friend to New York. We lived in New York, and it was winter, and, and it was cold, and I was depressed. I was sitting on the window, and I saw all this snow, and I was freezing, and I said, ah, I would come to Israel just for two weeks of sun, and then I'll be back to New York. I came to Israel. It was so much fun. And then I didn't know how to stay because I told myself, you have to come in just for two weeks. So, you know, it's hard for us to change our plans. The thing that we are promising to ourselves. I looked at the newspaper and I said, I'm going to look at the advertising of workers. You know, if and I'll see the most crazy thing that they will never accept me to work there. And if I'll get this work, I'm staying in Israel. And I was 22 years old. I didn't learn in the university. I didn't, you know, I was just, I just released from the army and then I went to the U.S. And it was written there in the newspaper. It was, we need marketing a VP for a newspaper who deals with science. I don't have anything with science. <laughs> we belong to the, to the Israeli University, Jerusalem University. Uh, we need uh, something like that. I said, okay, this one, nobody will take me, of course. I didn't even graduate, but, and I said, okay, I'm, I went there for an interview and they looked at me and they said, come on, man, you don't, you, don't, you didn't <laughs> learn marketing. You didn't, you don't know what you're saying. And I said, okay, you write, you write for everything, but I'm asking you, give me two hours, give me your magazine. I will go to the library now. I will write you a marketing program for the next year. And you're going to take it to all the people that, you know, the professors of business in your business school. And then if it's not good, let me know and don't take me. And I was writing it for two hours. I gave it to them. After two days, they called me and said, okay, you hire. Well, that's not a good advert for education. Yeah, and I was good at it. And then I was good in marketing and people start to hear about this young guy who was very good in marketing. So I had this technology company that called me and they said that they need a head of marketing in, in Jerusalem branch. And I told them, as I always want more than what they're giving me. And I said, I want to be the head of the branch. How do I do that? And they said, listen, Jerusalem is very low now on sales. When you're going to be more than Tel Aviv and Haifa all together, you're going to be there. So for them, it was like five years from now. After four months, I became the, the head of the, <laughs> the Jerusalem branch. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was good in marketing. And then I was waking up one morning with a beautiful friend of mine. Her name was Katya, and she looked at me and she said, why you are so sad when you go to work? I said, I'm not sad, I'm, everything is okay. And she said, no, I'm, I'm looking to your soul, to your eyes, and I see that you are very sad, that you're not satisfied. And I said, yeah, it's, you know, work. And then she said, what would you do if I'll give you a billion dollar? I said, I'm going to be an actor. She said, okay, it's a good idea. And then she opened the yellow pages and she opened it, opened it and she said, this is the best acting school in Israel called Nisan Nativ. Let's call them right now. Uh, we called them and they said, listen, we are starting in two weeks. We got, we already got all the exams. It's like three days of exam, then another three days, another two days. And then we, from 750 people, we're getting 15. I would call them every day. And I said, listen, you have to watch, see me, you have to see me, you have to see me. And the end of the day, they, I came and I did like two monologues and they worked with me for two hours. And then they called me and they said that I'm in. So the time from the decision that I want to be an actor to really start into an acting school was two weeks. And people, you know, they are getting ready for it for years. Oh my gosh, they're preparing from as soon as their children can stand. They're putting them into schools and classes and stuff. So had you done any acting before? I was at school, you know, when I was like nothing, nothing special. And, and I came and I came there and I, and I was very different from the other people because they all came from like very, they were very artistic. And I came from business. You know, I had my sport car, everybody, they didn't have money. I brought my, my sport car, my, my, all the gadgets that I used to have. So it took me like six months to pull out all the, like an onion that I had on me all those things that I, I used to, to put on me in order. To, and then I became like one of, I, I became an artist as well. But how did you even know that it was something you wanted to do? I think when I was young, I really wanted to do that. At school, I learned theater and acting. And also in the army, we were actors. You have to be a very good actor in order to do what you do. And I needed the adrenaline. I think it was because of the adrenaline. I was addicted to adrenaline because of, because of the, the service in the army. I didn't know that, but I love challenges. And then I love adrenaline. So when I was there to, to be in front of people, to learn theater, to talk in front of, to act in front of a lot of people, it's an adrenaline rush and I needed it. 
So I think this was why I went there. And I'll tell you another secret. I didn't believe in myself that I can be good at university. I wanted to learn marketing and business. I was suffering from ADHD and I thought when I was young that I'm very stupid. Yeah, and that's how schools make you feel if you're not in the mold. I thought I'm lazy and I thought that I'm stupid. And I said that I, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to the university to math and everything. I thought it was, it was going to be very hard for me. You know, I was lecturing for, for teachers later a few years ago about ADHD, about how to help kids with ADHD. Because as a person, you have to be successful in something. You cannot sit at school and don't not be successful in, in anything. So the kid that they have ADHD, they try to be successful in art, in sports, stuff like that. So you have to develop that. And from the other side, if they don't have that, so they're going to, to other bad places, you know, in order to be not successful, but in the front, the people will, will see them. I'm trying to help kids now with ADHD in order to understand how blessed they are because ADHD is a blessing. It is a blessing. People doesn't know that, but it's a blessing because you can think about ideas that nobody can think of. You can have imagination that nobody has. You just need to embrace it. You em to embrace your ADHD and not to hate it or to fight against it. Yeah, and you're a fantastic role model for that. That must just give them such a boost. In those early days coming out of drama school, you were doing a mixture of film, TV, theater. Was there any particular media that you preferred? I had a, like an improv group that we did like improvisation. I was very funny guy. I just want to let you know. Let you know. <laughs> First of all, I thought that when I go out from school, I will be the superstar of Israel. <laughs> Didn't happen. <laughs> I was struggling. I was struggling. Everybody said no. And, and it's, it's very hard to be an actor. And I have a big ego. I have a huge ego. And to get a no all the time, and it's not about that I'm, I'm selling a phone or glasses, does it, that you can say, I don't like those glasses. They're good, but I don't like them. Here it's about you. I don't like you. You are not good. Yeah, that's really hard to take. Very hard. So I was struggling there. And as I told you before, I wanted to succeed in something. So I started my own different career in, 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 in advertising. I was the uh, head of creative of BBDO in Israel. This is after drama school. Yeah, yeah, after. Yeah. And I, and I had like production company that we did commercials. By accident. It's, I started it by accident. It was a funny story. I went to see a good friend of mine. She worked for the biggest cellular phone company in Israel. She was working at the marketing. And then she uh, introduced me the head of marketing of this company. And I went back home. I was sitting on my roof, getting sun, drinking beer, no work, nothing, getting a phone call. <laughs> the head of um, marketing of this company called me and he said, so Lior, I remember, right, you're producing commercials, right? And I looked at the phone looked at me and said, yes, I'm, I'm producing commercials. And <laughs> this is how I started my company, <laughs> my production company. I've watched you in a whole bunch of things now, which has been so much fun for me because I am pretty mediocre at most things, but I am brilliant at watching television. And I've watched you in Underground Six, where you're that horrible, loathsome dictator, and Mary Magdalene, where I was able to see that you also sing didn't realize that. And then Operation Finale, which I've just finished the other day with Ben Kingsley, who plays Adolf Eichmann. I mean, what a piece of history that was. Did you get to meet any of the guys who were actually on that operation? Because I guess some of them would still be alive, wouldn't they? Yeah, no, I was playing the, the head of the Mossad that already died, the Zamir. But I knew this story for all my life. So I didn't have to. I knew everything. And it was a nice experience to work with Sir Ben Kingsley. Yeah. I would love to get a Sir one day. You're doing all the right things, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about Fowder, because as I said at the very beginning, we have just loved it and lived it. How did you come to write that? It was timing and a good question of Avi, my partner. I was in the, in the West Bank with him. He looked at me and he asked me if I have a dream. And I looked at him and said, yes, I have a dream. I want to write something about the undercover units, about the mental price that they are paying for their action, the families. And I wanted also to write about the Palestinian side because in the Israeli culture, nobody talks about it. And I really want to open this window to the Israeli audience to watch how they live over there and what's going on over there. And Avi told me that he had the same dream for a long time. So we started. He told me that 
let's write it. Let's write something. And I, and I told him I have PTSD, but I have HDHD as well. ADHD as well. <laughs> so it's going to be very hard. But we uh, we started to sit and, and wrote. We just puke everything that we had in our souls for so long. So that's what happened. And we never wrote anything in our life before. Never, nothing. No scripts, nothing. We never learned how to write a script. And did you go to the TV companies with an entire manuscript or did you go to them with an idea? How does it work? We went with a synopsis, an idea, but very detailed. And we just had to pitch it. And everybody said no. (laughs) Nobody wanted it. (laughs) So what happened? We were going on and moving on, moving on. And even our production company that was with us said that, come on, it probably won't be. It's not a good idea because nobody wants it. And then, as I told you, when they're closing a door, we were looking for the window. So we knew about a woman that Avi learned with when we were, he was a kid, and she was working at the marketing of this satellite company in Israel called Yes. And we asked her to help us to get a presentation, and she made it. And then we went to the presentation. And even in the presentation, when we were pitching, there were three ladies who were sitting there. They did the same movement with the same sound at the same time. They said like they... Oh no, I hate that sound. Yeah, I, I was, and I stopped and I said, why are you saying, why, what, what happened? What, why, why are you suing? And they said, because it's a man, manly show and it's a show that just men will watch. And we don't believe that any women, we want to watch that show. Actually, they did some poll after that, uh, the show went out. First of all, it's the most viewed show in Israel. Second of all, the majority of the, of the viewers are women. And then this guy over there said, yes, I want it. And he was the only person in the Israeli television industry who believed in our dream. And you know what? It's about, if we're talking about dreams, you need just one person in order to make your dream come true and to just one person to believe in you. And that's it for life. And we have to remember that we can be this person who believe in other people and to help them to fulfill their dreams. No, that's true. To me, it seems incredibly balanced and Doron is far from perfect. Obviously, you know, we're invested in you because you're the protagonist. And so we know about your unit, your family, your dreams. But it is, as I said, far from perfect. One of the characters, Bashar Hamdi, who's a lovely boy, and you really mess him up. What's the feedback from Palestinians and Israelis alike about the show? It was number one in Lebanon. It was number one in the UAE. It was it was all over the Arab world. It was number one. So there you are. That's the answer, really. Yeah, it's crazy. And also, we had a new show called Hit and Run. I don't know if you watched it. I have watched it, and I absolutely loved it, apart from the fact that at the end it ends on a cliffhanger, which is really annoying. But um, I was gripped. <laughs> so Hit and Run and Fauda was big hits in the Arab world. And you know what I love about it? That... Palestinians, there are some few probably hates it because we are we showing Israelis winning in the end of the day. But you know what? If this is what the, the criticism about the show from Arab people that the Israelis are always winning and 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 we are the heroes. But Doan is this hero. He's losing all the time. He never wins. Never wins. It's people saying, oh, it's like James Bond. No, no, he's not winning. He's losing all the time. And this is what I love about this character because he cannot win, never. And and this is what, this is all about the story of the war. Nobody wins. Everybody loses. Everybody loses. Nobody can win this, this, this thing. And so most of the, the majority of the, of the people from the art world saying that this is for the first time for them, that they're feeling com- compassion to the Israeli side. But also from the other side, from the Israelis, militant Israelis, right-wing Israelis who are saying, who are telling me, Lior, I'm, we're feeling for the, for the Arab side. Why, what, what, what did you do? I don't want to feel for, the, for these terrorists, but I feel for them. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and women falling in love, Israeli women falling in love with the Arab guy. It's like, it's, it's crazy. A few months ago, there were in an Egyptian article about us, about Avi and I. They wrote about us. We didn't know about it. That we actually changed the way the young Arabs now watching and looking on about Israelis because of that show. We are not anymore the old Jews as we are were portrayed in the TV shows, in their art, in their newspapers. Now they see that we have faces. We, as you said, we're doing bad stuff, but we also 
trying to be good as well. And we have families and we have life as well as they have. So this is what we're trying to do to show everybody have something to lose and everybody losing all the time, most of the time. Well, and I think that's what's so powerful about film and television, because if you can read endless newspaper articles, you can hear about all these terrible things that are going on, but until you personalize it, you can't really identify with it. So that's where you can get those shifts in thinking, which is incredibly powerful. And when you go on set, I listened to an interview with Kate Winslet recently, and she said that to prepare for her most recent role, she was playing a very depressed person. And so she thought about how she was going to walk, how she was going to, how she lowered her voice and just everything was heavy. And and then apparently Viggo Mortensen, in his role of Aragon in Lord of the Rings, he would sleep rough to get into his role. Now, you've lived your role to a certain extent, but do you have to sort of meditate or get into the zone or can you be joking and laughing and then click into it? Every actor has, has his different method. And for me, is in Fauda, I'm trying to live this character through me. I'm trying to put him inside of me and to see how we all was act, were acting in the same situation. I'm not trying to lower my voice in order to be... No, no. <laughs> no, I'm, no I'm, trying, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a different uh, method. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm trying to see how would I act if I was in this situation of this person. So I'm bringing myself to the, this is very hard. I'm trying to put myself in the same situation. I'm stressing my abilities as well, my mental abilities as well when I'm doing it. I'm not a nice guy when I'm, when I'm shooting Fauda, when I, we, we were shooting Hit and Run. I went out in New York. I lived in New York with all my tattoos and everything. People were looking at me like I, I'm a gang member. I was living that situation. I was depressed in hit and run. He lost his wife. The whole hit and run, it's five, six days, the whole show. So you have to be in a grieving mode for six months of shooting. So I was in a grieving mode and a fighting mode for six months. It was, I was, yeah, it wasn't easy to be, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Yeah. And then if you see your family, can you lift yourself out of it or not really? You have, you're just yeah, there. It depends, but I was in a very, when I was shooting hit and run, I had a very rough situation even with my wife. And I think I took this character and the situation into my personal life as well. Do you do your own stunts? Any of your own stunts? I do. I do. Most of my stunts, I love it. No stuntman can shoot better than me. They can jump better than me and they can run better than me. So if it's very, very, very dangerous, I wouldn't do it. But all the fighting, I know martial arts, so I know how to fight. I know how to drive, so I'm doing all my driving stunts. I just love it. When you see all the driving in Fauda or Hit and Run, it's me. Yeah, I love it. I love, I love that adrenaline. This is why I'm living for, this adrenaline. And it's part of it. I broke my rib, I turned my muscles, I, I, did, I wounded a lot, but it's part of it. Well, it's been the most phenomenal success. The show won six awards in 2016, including Best Drama Series at the Israeli Academy Awards. In 2017, the New York Times voted Fauda the best international show. And in 2018, the show won 11 Israeli TV Academy Awards, including Best TV Drama, Best Actor. So you're doing a great job. Best Screenplay, Casting, Cinematography, Recording, special effects. Can you recall a moment where you were able just to sit down and think about what you've done and think, I'm pleased? Wow. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not pleased yet. <laughs> I don't know if I will be, but this is my motivation in life. You know, I don't know if I will be ever pleased, but something that happened to me that I think that I'm, I'm blessing it that I don't need to prove myself. I don't feel that I need to prove myself to anyone anymore. This is the thing that I gained from uh, the success of Fauda and, um, and from what we're doing now in Hit and Run, that I know that I'm okay. That I don't need to prove anything to anyone anymore. All the success must have changed your life. And do you have your own bodyguards now? No. Funny story that happened. I was shooting in Abu Dhabi. They brought me a bodyguard there because we didn't know what's going to be. It was before the peace pro that happened be between the UAE and Israel. And I remember they brought me a bodyguard and, and I met him and, and I told him, okay, so we're going to run tonight. And he said, I can't, my back is hurting. I said, okay. Oh. <laughs> and then I, w I went out from the car and he was going out after me 
and he was supposed to, to be in front of me. He did some many mistakes of guard of that that you cannot be. And then I told him, I called his boss and I said, listen, I, I, I want to protect myself. I don't want to protect him as well. And then I went without a bodyguard. But sometimes when I'm going, I was in, in London and there were some threats from the BDS movement. The Israeli embassy gave me some bodyguard, which was nothing. And how have you coped with the trappings of fame? Because there are some great upsides to it and some pretty major downsides as well. Definitely. It's great. It's amazing. It's it's blessing. And I'm very thankful of where I am right now. And I, and I remember that, you know, in the end of the day, from I'm, I'm drinking coffee. I drank the same coffee a few years ago. I'm going to eat my roasted chicken later. I, I ate it like a few years ago. Nothing has really changed, you know. In the end of the day, we're all doing the same things. Sometimes it's more comfortable. Sometimes it's less comfortable. But we just need to remember that in the end of the day, like, I don't see any difference between me, famous, to other people that I know, my friends, my old guy, my old friend, my old gang. So I'm trying to keep it simple. I'm not trying to be, uh, to take the fame and, and glorify it or to, I don't know what to do with it. I'm not going out a lot. It's hard. It's not easy, you know. So I'm trying to keep it simple. A lot of people will come out of the woodwork and sort of want to have a piece of you and that's, well, including me, and that's a very <laughs> annoying. There was a funny story that you told about coming in, going into LA to the immigration. Yeah, could you talk about that? Oh yeah, it wasn't in LA. It was I was in my way to Miami, and I think I was landed in in New York. As an Israeli, it's very hard because you need the visa. It's not ESTA like you have. I have my my French passport, but I had visa and everything. So I, I was there. It's okay. And, but I, but still, there is interrogation over there from the police people that sitting there from the immigration. And one woman over there, she was looking and she was staring at me, not looking, she was staring at me all the time. And I and I thought, okay, she's going to interrogate me. I, they they will see that I have bombs in my shoes. <laughs> you know? And then a guy came that was in front of me, and she was she was free now. And then the guy that, that I, and I was online in 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 line, and then. I said, told the guy that behind me, no, you can go because I didn't want to go to her. And she saw that and she said, you're right now, come here, come. And <laughs> she looked at me and I was sweating. And then she said, when is the second season of Fauda? I said, what? <laughs> Are you watching Fauda? And she said, yeah, everybody watch Fauda. And then she said uh, to the, all the policemen, hey, Doron is here, Doron is here. And everybody were, it was the most welcoming entrance to the US that I had. Brilliant. Well, you are very cool. You're a deadly operator, but even the cool, deadly operators must make mistakes sometimes. Could you describe an embarrassing moment? Where? Anywhere. In anywhere in your life. If someone were to write a book about me, it would. the title would be a series of embarrassing moments because what was that's your all I do. What was your embarrassing well, moment? Well, I have so many. but um, Tell me the most embarrassing one. Well, I can, but I will cut it out because um, <laughs> no, no one will want to hear my embarrassing moment. Okay. Well, one of them, there are so many. Was, no, tell um, me the one that you thought about that you want to cut out. Okay, fine. Okay. So that one was going to a friend's 40th birthday and I was wearing a very nice dress, I thought. And I was wearing a thong actually as well anyway because then it like, keeps the lines of the dress and um and my husband does this kind of rock and roll thing and I said don't do it but anyway he doesn't listen to me stressful being married and he kind of threw me and when the photographs came back the photographer had managed to take a picture of me with my dress around my ears upside down yeah. bare bottom and I said you have to get rid of that photograph and they said of course we'll get rid of it of course we will of course it's the the front cover of their album so that's really nice my upside down really bottom sure. so that's one of them <laughs> but there are many so one of my embarrassing moments I was like 23 and there was a show of someone like like very punk in Israel and I went with my friend that we are not in this kind of uh, music and we are not in this uh, uh, scene. So I told him how we need to get dressed. And he said, let's wear this black shirt with holes and, and like tights and stuff like <laughs> that, like punk. <laughs> yeah. and I said, okay, let's go. And we put some eyeliner, black eyeliners. We said, let's, let's be foolish. But I thought that I would be foolish with like thousands of people over there, like dressed like me. <laughs> and I went there and it was in a kibbutz. You know, what's a kibbutz? Like a small community in Israel. I went there coming out from the door of the car with my black eyes. <laughs> and I don't see anyone. 
and I'm getting in, and then there was this singer with his guitar playing with his jeans and T-shirt for like 10 old people. <laughs> and I came there, and I wasn't famous, so it's okay. I wasn't famous that nobody took a picture of me, but it was funny. That's a good one. What advice would you give to these young people starting their military service now? Be a man, be a good person, try to, to give good to the people that you are surrounded by. And don't forget where you're coming from and where you're going after the army, because it's very easy to forget. So don't forget your family, your values. Stay and keep it while you are serving in the army, because the life is much longer than three years. What plans do you have or what would you like to achieve in the next 10 years? Hopefully a lot more Fowder season. So without shooting Fowder for season, I'm in the middle of the shooting now. So we have another month in Israel and then we have a break of a month and then we're going to shoot in Europe somewhere. My goals are to be more with my family, with my kids and to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, just don't change anything. Just keep it going. I don't want to change anything. Just keep it moving, keep it going, rest more, travel more in the world and uh, try to be more with my family and meet interesting people like we did in the UK. That was a great festival, the Cliveden Festival. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I can't wait for Fowder season four. And when my one of my daughters was 12, she was really looking forward to a holiday and she said, I can't wait. And I said, I know it's so exciting, Bar. And she said, no, no, no. And these tears kind of rolled down her cheeks. And she said, you don't get it, mommy. I can't wait for this. So I would say to you, we can't wait for Fowder. Neither can my friends, Fiona and Ben, who were there with their ice and jumping into the water. So we can't wait. And I can't tell you how lovely it's been to talk to you today. So thank you so, so much. It was lovely to talk to you and we can go next time to an ice bath. Yes. When you next come to the UK, we will find some, some very, very cold water. <laughs> that would be really cool. 